2021 uh, for System Thinking Ontario. Um, and we're starting off the year with uh, going a little bit further than we've been going because uh, uh, Gary Metcalf's actually in Kentucky. Um, we've almost been running a year now for uh, System Thinking Ontario being online. And one of the advantages we have is that we can actually reach out to people beyond uh, what we're usually doing. Uh, someday we may get back together and all be physically together again at OCAD, but uh, we'll have to see how that goes. So traditionally, we start off System Thinking Ontario going around the circle, um, and I'll try to catch up with people as they go along. But um, uh, usually the question we ask is, uh, you know, what's your name and uh, how you came to systems? And so I'm going to pick in the middle and kind of go around. I'm going to start and ask, oh, oh, the other thing I should mention is that uh, we are recording the session. If you uh, don't want your face to be shown, you should turn your camera off. Um, you can speak with your camera off if you want, then you'll be pretty nameless. Um, I'm behind on uh, actually uh, getting the videos done. I'm back in October. I managed to get the September ones done, but I have to work through October and November to get those ones up before I can get these ones up. Um, but uh, let's go around and uh, introduce ourselves a little bit. Uh, Lori. Hi there, uh, Lori Ball Little Johns. Um, my feet are planted in Invermere, British Columbia, Canada today. I think I've participated in one other Systems Thinking Ontario. I'm always interested to talk about systems. How I came to systems, uh, uh, an old social worker and family systems theory was probably the first introduction, but uh, more intensively, I completed a PhD in public health where complexity and system science were uh, key methods and theoretical foundations. So thank you. Thanks. I have someone labeled Liana and Michael. No. <coughs> okay, we'll move on and come back. If someone wants to yell and throw it at me. Um, Don, say hi. Hi. Let's see, where are we now? Here we are. Oh, guy in there somewhere. There we go. Um, yes. Uh, well, my name is Don Officer, and I've been uh, uh, a frequent uh, attendee of these sessions because I, uh, I like to keep my hand in. This is, this is a topic which is really important to a lot of the things I'm doing, and um, I'm, I think I have ideas about why it's now being downplayed, but you don't want to hear them, I'm afraid, <laughs> based on recent research. Um, I guess I first came to systems because, um, well, it always seemed natural to me, and then the, the, uh, <clears throat> the Army decided to, to train me in, uh, in work study, which had a systems component. And uh, you know operations research and all that stuff and systems and procedures, but I didn't stop there because I felt they were only scratching the surface, and I wasn't wrong. Um, but I've been very very interested in how it is being how it develops and how it has been ignored so so carefully and so totally by so many disciplines over the years. And uh, that's something I want to get to the bottom of. Anyway, I've talked enough. <laughs> Thanks. Christoph. Hi, I'm Christoph Becker. I'm an associate professor of information at the University of Toronto. And I meant to join these Systems Thinking Ontario sessions for a long time, and I'm finally managing to do that. I came to Systems Thinking um, because so my background is computer science, and I was some six years ago, I became very interested in sustainability and how we can shift systems design and computing to become more sustainable. And that led um, to systems thinking very naturally. So I've been very engaged in that. And I'm actually teaching a systems thinking course um, starting tomorrow again at the uh, U of T and looking forward to that. Thanks. Alexis. Hi. I'm Alexis and I'm a student at OCAD um, in the SFI program. So it's nice to see some familiar faces there. And I'm currently in my MRP, so major research project stage of my master's. And um, yeah, I'm just excited to see some faces that I haven't seen in a while. What's, what's the MRP on, Alexis? Oof. 
do we have all night? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's uh, generally about, um, it's, it's sort of a foresight project where I'm looking to uh, foster a uh, better relationship with our future selves in order to make better decisions to say today. And it's generally around climate change. And I'm, I'm trying to use photography as an autoethnography tool. Thanks. Elena. Hi, um, I'm Elena Leonard. I ran into <clears throat> systems. Um, my very first doctoral studies course with Barry Clemson, uh, who was at that point president of the American Society for Cybernetics and have not looked back since. Uh, right now, I'm part of the organizing team of our first totally electronic integration, where we're using a combination of Zoom, Miro, Shed or Sked scheduling program and Slack, and having uh, really good discussions, but also some kinks with the technology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Just checking. I'm not, never sure with the headset. Um, let's see. I came to systems because my background is in design technology and <clears throat> working with organizations on change, all kinds of change. Um, and I'm also currently in the, the grad program at the University of Houston for a strategic foresight. So I, this came up on my radar. Um, I'm taking systems thinking as a course next semester, and I thought this would be a great way to, you know, get excited for class starting in two weeks. So it's nice Welcome. to meet you all. <laughs> great. Uh, Chandak. Hi, uh, I'm Chandak. I work for the government here uh, in, in Toronto in, in the transit services. I am a professional in change and transformation, hence my curiosity in, in systems thinking. I landed upon a website by Dr. Steve Easterbrook from the University of Toronto and where I had saw the link to this forum and I thought I'd join in and hear the experts speak about systems thinking. Great, thank you. Gray. Hi, sorry. <laughs> Uh, my name is Grace. Ooh, I am very fuzzy. Anyway, uh, my name is Grace. I'm also a graduate student at the OCAD University um, in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program, and I just presented my MRP. So, well. <laughs> wrapping up very shortly. Um, and the way that I came to get to know systems and systems thinking is that I was introduced to it by a friend um, and then I was like, oh, I have to be in a program about this. This is really interesting. And then I ended up taking courses on it. And here I am now attending <laughs> sessions on systems thinking. Thanks, Grace. Nelia. Hi, uh, I'm a, a student at uh, OCAD in the SFI program. Um, my background is in uh, international development and then law. I'm trained as a lawyer and I run my own practice um, specializing in tech, tech uh, related law stuff. Um, it's mixed practice. And I also uh, teach a course on law and regulation in the blockchain development program at uh, George Brown. Thanks. Lucia. Right. Oh, hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry for the blurry picture. There's not too much light around me. Um, I came across your group years ago, and I used to go on a regular basis to Toronto. Um, so I'm super happy to see that the group is super, super big right now. I um, still see that some faces are the same as they used to be before. Elena is here, and David, and Peter. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to be back. I came across uh, system thinking uh, years ago as a part of my PhD program. Unfortunately, I, I didn't finish. However, the system thinking keeps somehow following me. So uh, I just applied for, for a job where they uh, were asking about um, system thinking and, and, and design. And I said, huh, I think I know what to do. And so um, I, I just came across David's email, who those years kept sending the emails, you know, and I'm back. So uh, thank you very much for having me. 
Lucia, where are you these days? Right now I'm in Costa Rica. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had to I had to decide either I have internet or I have lights. So I opted for internet. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> there's, there's not too much light around because inside um, I just can't get the signal. So, um, okay. That way. Thanks Thank for you. joining. Uh, Medina? Hello. Uh, so nice to virtually meet all of you. Uh, so I'm Medina. I'm a higher educational professional. I work at Centennial College uh, in student life, but uh, part-time I work, I study at OCAD in the SFI program. And how I came about systems is I'm taking a systems course uh, this semester and I got carried away with my readings over the break. And now I'm super excited and um, just wanted to meet other people in the field as well. Great. Thank you. Extra points. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, we haven't even met yet. <laughs> no, we haven't. Hello, Peter. <laughs> okay, Jian. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm also a student um, at OCAT at the um, SFI program. So I came to systems because of the class that I took with Peter and David last last January. Um, and I think this is my second time here with this group. And last time I presented my uh, synthesis map on our COVID <laughs> pandemic response backing, backing uh, when it first started. Mm -hmm. So yeah, excited to continue the discussion here. Thanks. Kevin. Hi. Um, I was studying thermodynamics in the early 80s and came across a passage which uh, showed that the Gibbs uh, equation for statistical entropy was the exact inverse of Shannon's definition of information. So I started reading about systems stuff because of that uh, cross-disciplinary thing. And uh, <clears throat> I, along with Peter and others, are carrying on the work of Warf John Warfield and Alexander Christakis and Hassan Ozbekan of the structured modeling or structured technology enabled structured deliberations. There's a lot of names for it. And we, we meet every week on Saturdays. Uh, first Saturday of the month is, is uh, about mathematical developments. The third Saturdays of the month are about applications for been working uh, mostly on a very uh, planning a very large scale for a d distributed um, deliberation to promote systems literacy, which has been a subject uh, that's been led by Gary and Peter Tottenham, who is a member of our group for I don't know at least seven eight years. So um, <laughs> I'm glad to be connecting with Gary. We were connecting over the year over this uh, summer on the disruption to the regional food uh, systems due to COVID because I, as a hobby, my wife and I run a farmer's market. And uh, so Gary was giving us the 30,000 foot view of what was happening. Thanks, Kevin. Jasmine. Um, hi, <laughs> I am a graduate student from OCAD and I'm currently studying design for health. Just um, having a course with Peter this morning and thank you for sharing the link. Uh, this is my first time joining this kind of event. I just want to um, know more about system thinking. So I'm here. <laughs> Great, thank you. Zad. Hi everyone, my name is Zad Khan. Uh, I'm a graduate student from the OCAD2 Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. So I came to systems thinking through uh, Peter Jones's course, uh, Introduction to System and Systemic Design. Um, and David Ng was also a guest lecturer uh, at the time, and we connected uh, on a system changes project since, since then. So I've been coming to System Think Ontario since 2017, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Thanks. Daisy? Hi. Um, I came to System Thinking uh, just, I don't know how, uh, just I think I've been Brighton just uh, synthesis mapping and then I just uh, caught kind of a bug it seems like, so I've been coming for a few years. 
especially when I was in person, it was really nice to be in person and interacting that way. And actually now virtually, it's still actually it's even a little bit better because there's actually more people here. And I just like to listen in and just relate it to a lot of different things I've done. Uh, my educational background is electrical engineering. So this is kind of, and I don't really work in that area. So this is kind of a reminder and um, just different ways of uh, just for me to get back to that kind of thing. Thanks. Nishat? Oh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's really great to meet you all virtually. So my name is Nishat Korada, and um, I've been in touch with a few systems people, especially in college. Um, they gave me a book to read called The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance when I was like 20 years old. And after I read it, that on it was like sign up one on and that led me into systems thinking and to david ing who has been inviting me here since last year thanks joanne hello this is joanne dong um, i'm a business and enterprise architect uh, i came across complexity science by chance, back in 2012, 2013, uh, I was hooked uh, immediately. I was already familiar with Christopher Alexander's uh, timeless ways of building a pattern language from working in technology and in business. So that led me to uh, systems thinking theory and then ACOV and uh, Jamsheet, uh, I was hooked. Um, so I, resigned from my corporate job at uh, IBM and Infrastructure Ontario to do research, uh, further research in complexity science, systems thinking, um, <laughs> psychology and architecture, uh, trying to integrate um, uh, systems thinking principles and design principles together into architecture. So this was 2014, fast forward, um, of being an independent business architect and systems designer and architect since then. So David uh, in, um, so introduced me to this group and his learning circle uh, last August. So, um, so I'm very happy to be here and it's a very nice meeting you all. Thanks, Dean. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dean. Uh, my first appearance at one of your events. So thanks for uh, extending a broad invitation that uh, very briefly. Um, I did a master's and dropped out of a PhD back in the mid nineties in uh, theoretical physics, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. I was at McGill and uh, became very interested in systems thinking, uh, decided to abandon academia, turn myself into environmental policy and climate policy dude, uh, working that for a long time, attended a number of uh, Canadian Society for Ecological Economics conferences back at the end of the 90s and early, early 2000s, which was also all about the application of some of the kinds of things I'd thought about in physics to environmental problems, which I was uh, very interested in. And uh, yeah, I recently moved to Toronto, but uh, still work in Calgary, uh, where I'm a uh, what's called a hearing commissioner at the Alberta Energy Regulator, where I decide on applications for big energy projects. And I've been thinking about what I do when I stopped doing that. And I became really interested recently in thinking about systems thinking. Thanks, Dean. Mm. Brent. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is my first time out to one of these. I'm a doctoral candidate in computer science at Western University, and I, I saw a link advertised to this by a systems group, so I thought I'd come out and see what it was all about. Thanks. Jananda? Hi. Um, I'm Jananda Lima. I... I'm a former uh, student of Peter Jones, and that's why I know about this group. I participated in the last one, and that was my first one. So this is my second one, and I'm very interested in systems. So I'm here because of this. And I work with indigenous um, peoples as well. So I think it will be interesting for me. Thank you. 
Uh, Kelly, say hi. Hi, I'm Kelly Okamura. Uh, I came through uh, two systems through Peter Jones and Design with Dialogue and somehow came into systems thinking. And I work with uh, David uh, on the Systems Changes Learning Circle. Uh, my background would be largely in change. So Thanks, welcome. Kelly. Peter. Um, hi, um, I'm Peter Jones. I know know a lot of the folks in the in the room. I'm a um, professor in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Design for Health at, at OCAD and also practitioner. Um, and and uh, just, uh, you know, there's so many different ways that I guess that that um, that that systems thinking or theory came to me, you know, from from different books. So Zen, the art of motorcycle maintenance. Wow. I mean, that's probably that is probably one of the early ones that in politics of experience things as a teenager, um, but probably a really influential in, influence that I've never mentioned in, the, in David's ubiquitous uh, opening question would be that um, the influence of, of uh, cognitive science and, and Don Norman's psychology in, as an undergraduate in learning um, human information processing and trying to challenge that um, in AI, in the developing AI and expert systems world uh, as an undergraduate and taking that into my master's research. And so thinking about um, um, human, um, you know, human cognitive processes in a systemic way that could be adapted effectively into, into I guess, good AI long before uh, machine learning is a thing. So good to be with everyone. Thanks, Peter. That brings us down to the last two who are, are uh, featured, uh, so Dan and Gary. And so I'll let Dan, Dan will be moderating the, uh, uh, the questions. And so Dan, why don't you introduce yourself first? Yeah, I came from uh, system thinking through, I guess, uh, way back in my business days with David when I'm sitting in this room with some other MBA people and David, and he told me that this stuff that we were learning in the MBA program was questionable. So it's only, uh, I don't know, 20 years later now that I suddenly figured, figured out what he meant. And so I've been in the system changes uh, learning circle, uh, kind of doing that stuff. Uh, one thing, just so in terms of the moderation part, after um, you know, Gary has a little spiel, I'm going to just go through some housekeeping stuff. Okay. I'm okay. from Toronto. Okay. Thanks. Um, and so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Gary Metcalf. Um, one of the interesting things about setting up um, these meetings, um, so I, I try not, Gary, I can't interview Gary because I'm known too well. And actually one of the uh, interesting issues that came along as we were doing this because we're sending things back and forth is I was looking for a photograph of Gary and then I, ha I realized I must be Gary's like a official photographer because we've done so much systems work together. I have photographs of him in Japan, in Austria, in London, uh, you know, like you name pretty well any conference he's going to be, there's going to be a photo of Gary around. It's not usually labeled, but he's usually in the photos. Uh, he's a former president of the International Society for the System Sciences and he was president of the International Federation for Systems Research, which is the systems, a system of systems organizations, if you want to describe it that way. And uh, he's, uh, he, he's, he's a long, one of the things I say about Gary, I actually claim I'm only a researcher. I never claim to be a teacher. Uh, Gary is actually a teacher. And so um, he has a long career uh, with Saybrook Institute. And uh, we'll hear more about that as we kind of a little earlier. So um, Dan, do you want to, kick off or how, how do you want to run this? Yeah, I'm just going to go through the housekeeping. So uh, first off, I, I spoke to uh, Gary about uh, sort of what he wanted to talk about. I think initially we had some ideas. Uh, so I think, you know, I guess with what's happened down in his uh, country there, um, it kind of got him into thinking about social systems. And so he wants to spend some time on that today. Now, it's that's the sort of um, topic, but I think he wants to do it in terms of the big questions in the background as a filter, as it were, as a lens. The big systems being, of course, system science, cybernetics, and complexity. So he'll be, as he goes through the social systems discussion, he'll try to kind of interweave those con concepts through it and uh, guide us through a bit of the development of those uh, areas. Um, so 
I asked him, so what about questions? Because he's going to uh, be going through a lot of territory and um, he felt that he'd be quite comfortable if you folks uh, were to interrupt his uh, discussion at any point in time that you were uh, wanting to do that. Um, so in terms of trying to do that in an orderly manner, um, you could obviously send a, a chat through, you could uh, click on the reaction thing so that you know, he has an indication that you'd like to um, kind of ask a question. And if he sort of doesn't stop <laughs> that sort of with those two prompts, then I'll sort of intervene on your behalf. Um, again, just to make it um, sort of run smoothly and not so much background noise, ask you to um, mute yourselves until you have a question. And that might be a sort of a way for, uh, for him to and me to realize that you want to say something also. How's that sound, Gary? Did it cover off the key points? I think we're good. Okay. <clears throat> well, with that, take it away, Gary. Good. Thanks, Dan. Well, thank you all for being here, first of all. And Peter, thanks for bringing about half the crowd. I, I really appreciate this. Um, so most of you have some familiarity with systems. So we're not going to start off with the, so what is a system or what are systems? Although we, we may back into that at some point. I'm a lot less interested in the theoretical parts, but I'm glad to entertain questions about that in whatever ways you want to. So let me just start most easily, I guess, with how I came into systems which I heard somebody say something about social work and family therapy. Um, that was really my point of entry. Um, although let me back up from that. Most people that I've ever met that most people have been exposed to systems. I mean, the, it's not like the term is somehow esoteric or new there. You know, people understand a solar system. People understand financial systems, although maybe not exactly. People get a sense that there are systems of some kind that are functional in some way, but it, you know, going from just hearing the term to understanding really what that means um, can be a really long bridge. My experience is that a lot of people hear about or, or are exposed to systems or the concept in some way, but the people who stay have a really different kind of interest. Because once you begin to understand the implications of what systems are and how they work and how they can change how we understand things, it's really hard to ever unsee that. Mm. So once people get here, they tend to keep looking for a better understanding of what that means. So my earliest introduction or my earliest questions, I guess, had a lot to do with why is it that things work the way they do and they're often not the way that people assume maybe that they work? So put yourself back in your own family of origin. <clears throat> and remember maybe the first time you went to visit a friend's family or went to a relative's house and you first got exposed to the fact that things didn't work the way they did in your house, the way that you thought they were normal and all of a sudden other people had different normals and then we begin to challenge all those as adolescents, of course, and begin to think about what's different about us as individuals relative to the context and the things that are expected of us. But most particularly, think about one of the first times that you had been gone from your family for a while and you went back and you found yourself in a setting where you were drawn back into expectations that were really strong. And they weren't necessarily the way you thought you were anymore, but they were really definitive. Now, that was my entree into things like working with kids in runaway shelters, being a family therapist. Because that concept was what was so strong when I started working with families, not just about how people operate and the strength of that context, but how strong it was, even when there was really great dysfunction, right? People were in pretty bad situations. People lived in situations where they were unhealthy, sometimes really destructive, but they couldn't figure out how to get out of them, right? There was a real strong power to that environment, to those expe expectations. And you could begin to describe those in all kinds of ways. Right? You know, what was it that kept people there? What was it that kept people sometimes trapped 
in those kind of situations. Well, my master's degree in social work was actually oriented towards family systems therapy. So it, it taught me about understanding and using context. And there were a couple of um, different variations at the time. There, there were people who worked on communications and trying to understand how people talk to each other within those settings. And there were people who really didn't pay so much attention to that and they considered themselves structuralist, right? So you've got kind of two camps, the, the communications people and the structuralist people. The argument of the structuralist was that you could ask people all day long what the situation was or what the problems were and they could explain it to you and they could tell you how much they didn't like it and wanted to get out of it. And <clears throat> we would make agreements about what could change. And you know, you'd go through a weekly session, four and five and six weeks, and they hadn't been able to really make any movement. And it wasn't that they didn't want to, they just didn't know how. They, they could tell you what they thought the issues were or the problems but it didn't ultimately change the behavior unless they were able to also do something else, right? So that was really my orientation to understand the strength of what a system is for people who live in and are, they are directed by or sometimes bound by those kind of systems, even when they aren't really necessarily healthy or functional. I spent about nine years working <clears throat> with kids in runaway shelters and their families and trying to understand this stuff and eventually figured out it was time for me to move on and, you know, move to a different kind of setting for a lot of reasons. So I ended up making a shift into corporations. So I worked for about 10 years, about 12 years, I guess, in, in two different fairly large corporations. Each of them had about 30,000 employees. And I was the sole person trying to figure out how to run mental health and substance abuse programs in these settings. It, probably not a big surprise for those of you who have been in corporate settings. Um, all I did was take the problems to a different level, right? It's the same problems in different settings. The good news about corporations was they had money if they wanted to deal with them, um, but it didn't make a whole lot of difference. And so you find things like you have managers who really are struggling and you find that people without any training in management tend to fall into patterns that are familiar. So managers have a tendency to manage the way they were parented, or they might learn from people that they had been exposed to as supervisors, but there's a really strong tendency that the way you learn about human actions and, and functioning, you tend to carry over into different settings. That's one level. You also find really quickly that corporations or most any organization has a culture of some kind. Now, sometimes that's heavily influenced and dictated by the senior person. And sometimes it's a really long legacy, right? And nobody can particularly explain that to you. And I have never seen a corporate culture defined in a corporate handbook that anybody gave you coming in, mm -hmm. right? That's the stuff you learn about the first two months when you figure out you don't know why things work the way they do. And you, you know, you, you did what you thought made sense and you stepped in it. And somebody finally said, uh, doesn't work that way here, right? And, and you begin to figure out what the subtle unspoken rules are. I mean, you can call that corporate culture or whatever, but in effect, it is systems. It is that setting, that context, that systemic environment that has a lot to do with how people operate together and how the organization functions in a broader way. I started my PhD. <clears throat> so I, I entered the corporation, first corporation in 1987. Uh, I started my PhD degree, PhD degree in 1995 at Saybrook, where I met Bela Banathy, mm -hmm. who would be my mentor in and through systems um, because it was social systems, but it was also design. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea why they came together at the time. And they came together for Bela well, for a whole lot of history. They came together for me only because Bela had just finished his book about um, systems design. And, uh, you know, it took me a while to kind of tease apart the fact that they weren't one and the same, but that they definitely had a lot of impact on each other. Yeah. So Bela's orientation had been in educational systems. And his contention was that we really lived in educational systems that had been designed for an industrial age 
And we just lived in the vestiges of those. They were not built to be functional for the, the societies that we have. They were simply the carryover that we continued to live with. So you can look at pictures. If you, if you go back, just you know, do kind of an internet search sometime and look for pictures of school classes from the 1800s, you're gonna see a classroom with desks that are lined up and a usually a chalkboard at the front of the room with a teacher's desk in front. Now, how much has that changed for 90 something percent of the classrooms around the world for young kids? Almost not, unless it's you know an innovative kind of place. So there is an authority who sits at the front who delivers information to people who receive it, who are then graded on what they can regurgitate about what they were told, who learn to follow rules like you move when a bell rings. It was an incredibly functional system for teaching people how to work in factories. It was not a functional system for teaching people how to be innovative, for teaching people how to work with each other it sure as heck wasn't set up for people to learn how to work at a distance because we've broken that in every way with the pandemic, right? Everything about what's not particularly functional about what people, about what kids need to learn and working with each other in online, remote, globally connected environments, all of that stuff became really apparent when we just broke the ability to go to a classroom. I can talk more about that, but let me let me launch a little bit more into what happened with the, the entree with Bela. <clears throat> so this whole concept of using systems, ideas, or principles for design it was a, an enormous question for me, more than it really was a, a clear answer at first. You know, remember at the time I was still working in a corporate setting. And so, you know, we didn't design the places we worked in. Right? We didn't design the, the departments. We didn't design the corporate setting. We you know, just did what corporations do and you got your marching orders and you, you, know, you, you had your annual goals, you did whatever it was you were supposed to do. <clears throat> but this, this whole thing about corporate change was also a pretty big deal over time. Right? So in the 1980s, you had a lot of downsizing. In the 1990s, there was a lot of outsourcing and you know, um, different functions moving overseas, uh, a lot of change going on in corporations. In fact, during the, it was pretty much during the 1990s that I was with the second corporation that was in here in Ashland, Kentucky for about 10 years. We went through three major reorganizations in those 10 years, three big consulting firms that came in to try to fix things. It was just one state of chaos after another. The last one that came in is probably the largest and most well-known across the world, um, the most expensive, I think. And they had a really interesting approach. They sent in 20-something year old MBAs with computer programs to ask people what it was that was wrong with the corporation. And then they came back and they gave a report that said, here's what your people said is wrong. And then the CEO got it okay to be able to do what he was gonna do anyway, which was lay off a whole lot of people. And then they moved on. You know, and they got paid. A, they got paid a million dollars a month to do that. It was amazing. So, <clears throat> what they called change was a whole lot of things that really had very little to do with creating what anybody envisioned about a better future. And those were the questions that I got posed in understanding with Bela. And really, the big question was: Is it possible for humans? to create the systems in which they truly want to live. And Bela's contention was yes. In fact, it was a lot bigger for Bela. For him, it was people have not only the right, they have the responsibility to design the systems in which they live. Now, remember, that's a two-edged sword, the right and the responsibility, which meant that there was a need for people to learn how to do that in order to be a functional part of the creation of the systems 
And once you create a social system, it's not a static something that you plug in, right? Social systems exist because we live them, we inhabit them, we act them out every day. That's the way they exist. So we design something which we will inhabit and bring to life. And that led me to the whole next set of questions, which is, okay, then what? I mean, you understand what you're, if you're designing something that is gonna be made of physical materials, then you probably need to know what those materials are, right? You're gonna design a bridge and you're gonna build it out of steel or you're gonna build it out of wood, or you're gonna you know, build a house out of certain materials and you know what you're working with. That's, that's an important part of it. What's a social system made of? I mean, if you're gonna design and build and enact a social system, what's it made of? What's the material? And I'll tell you, there's probably a lot of answers to that. And I don't know that there's an agreed answer to that. You know, it's communication, it's interactions, it's behaviors, it's, it's a lot of things, it's roles maybe. But there is a pressing and an increasing need, I think, for us to visit that question again and again. When you begin to look at the social systems that we live in now and the challenges we're faced with. So I've been cautioned about, um, I don't want to be too much of a political American. So I'm going to not go in, I'm not interested in really discussing the politics of the things we're facing right now. But let me just give you the example of the, where the questions are posed because they, they spread all over. Right now, the question in the US is, given the things that the US has been facing, the, let me just say that from my perspective, it is a big problem about the way the US has been governed recently. And the question has been posed, have those problems come because of the one person who has occupied the White House, or is that person indicative of bigger issues that really only, that, that one person could never actually cause but that run much deeper in the society and that are going to continue to be there even once that person is gone. Now, that's not just about the current situation in the US. That is just as much about every dysfunctional CEO that ever ran an organization or every manager who was really struggling in, in, the, in an organization. If you get rid of the person, do you get rid of the problem? Because if you don't, then the problem is different than just the person who inhabits the role or the office. That's a systemic question, right? That's really asking the nature of what's going on and to what degree it is found in a simple isolated answer or place or the degree to which you have to look broader and deeper for where the, the energy or the patterns or the you know, the, the whole way of the functioning of the, of the system works. Those are the kind of questions that get posed. And those questions for me ran from everything at the level of a family. How can you create, how can you make a family more functional? If you understand these things, can you, from the, from the start, create a family which for you is more functional to the the kinds of organizations and communities, to the way cities run, to the way that a company runs, to the way that large corporations run, to what we are faced with in terms of redesigning the kind of societies we need for climate change. It's the whole spectrum, but it's very similar questions that we're going to have to face about the degree to which we can consciously create these. And I'm pretty sure for myself that we don't create all of them. Right? I mean, we live in contexts that we don't totally get to decide. So some of it we will create and some of it we will simply adapt to. And we really got to be careful about what we assume about which things we can do. So let me pause and see if there are questions yet or if any of this is making sense or we need to take it a different direction.
We'll take questions if anyone has them. You want to pop in? Uh, Gary, yes. How how do you find intervention points in these really yeah. interweaving complex social cultural systems? I think in most cases you can, Joanne. So this is one of those questions that for me gets a little bit to the how do you define or how do you identify or how do you, um, how do you actually find and understand a particular system? It, it's kind of like the same question, you know, is the person the problem? It, on occasion it is, and that's a simple kind of system. In most cases, I find that it's a little more complex. In some cases, it's really complex. So there are, I mean, there are definitely, you know, organizational strategists and theorists who have talked about this stuff for a long time. So <clears throat> there, one, one way it got talked about was single loop versus double loop learning oh, yeah. for people who are familiar with that, right? So the single loop is you can fix the nature of the problem that's going on, but it, it, it's a fix. A double loop, a second loop, a, a larger way is you probably need to rethink and redesign the system itself. But you have to begin to ask, you know, so what's which is it that I'm going to have to deal with? There's a functionality for me that means it's more than just an arbitrary decision, right? If, if you begin to ask questions about the nature of how things are operating, you can get, you can begin to get a sense about where there are problems that maybe our assumed answers aren't what we thought. But let me give you a simple example. We may have talked about this in an earlier um, meeting. In the United States, when the pandemic shut down the educational system, shut down the schools, right? Everybody was clear that the schools stopped operating and so kids stopped going to school in the way they knew. What not many people realized was the degree to which the, I mean, people knew this, but I don't think they had really grappled with it. Schools are massively the daycare system for people to be able to go to work, right? So if you're talking about thinking about the educational system, when you shut that down, you also shut down the ability for parents to go to regular work if their kids weren't in a safe place. The third leg of this in the US is that a huge number of kids get the only predictable meals they get at school on any given weekday. So the educational system in the US was not simply kids going to school. It was also kids having care so parents could go to work and it was kids getting fed in places where they might not otherwise. And you can't untangle those if you're going to fix that system, right? You can't fix only one part of that and have the system be functional again in the US. You've got to deal with a whole package. So essentially, you've identified a much more entangled system in the way that it operates in the US than anybody would have ever told you because all of those things operate under different parts of the administration. They're funded differently. <clears throat> they, have no, they have no umbrella where somebody is dealing with all of that together. But when you look at the functionality, it is one unified system. We have some questions in the, ch in the chat. Um, I'm gonna okay. invite, invite Lee. Mm. Hi there. I was just um, thinking on what you were saying and what happened with the educational system also brought to the fore even more to the forefront how the school was also um, well when it when it was everyone went on quarantine how when it was not there it it brought to the forefront economic disparities uh, between people so. It, you know, everything from access to internet in yep. public housing 
and the way that they've built the public housing with um, I think like cement and things like that made it very prohibitive and just the, the whole way that providing internet to people and what made it viable for a company to provide internet versus like there was just a, a it just sort of it, it brought forth a lot of things yes yeah the pandemic broke a lot of dysfunctional systems yep now the question is are we going to go back and simply recreate those dysfunctional systems to be as you know we're going to put basically put the put the wheels back on a broken wagon mm -hmm. or are we going to consider the opportunity to recreate an educational system that's actually functional in new ways for what we as societies and what kids as young consumers need? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And, and seeing how it's linked into so many other systems, where would you start mapping that to, to gain awareness of the current state? Yes. Um, yep. I've done a, sorry, sorry, uh, late, but sorry. Right. If we, if we could, if we could cue, if we could cue on the, um, on the chat, please. Uh, Kevin has a question. No. I was just asking uh, Gary or anyone if they've been uh, impressed with anyone's articulation of the current, the roots of the current situation, as Gary was alluding to you know, a particular author or research agency like Rand Corporation or something like that. I haven't seen anybody dealing with it in the way that I've described it, Kevin. I mean, and that's challenging, needless to say. <clears throat> you know, at, at this point, what I feel like is most of the responses have been, how do we try to mitigate the problems as they are and return back to whatever people thought was normal. I've heard very few discussions about how do we take what we've learned and create a new system that is better, more functional, you know, more in tune with what we need. So Peter Tuttenham had appealed to our the structural modeling group or monthly group uh, about addressing the promotion of systems literacy and of course, it started in the context of the launch or the start of the pandemic. And, um, and so uh, Hassan Ozbekan, which is one of the founders of the structural modeling uh, methodology, which you're mm -hmm. familiar with, had a, had a phrase he used, which was, you have to uh, defactualize whenever you engage trying to model a new situation. You have to try to get rid of, as a facilitator, you can't really be neutral, but you, you have to try to forget or unassume your assumptions about the situation. Yeah. So I've been going through that for <laughs> six months and uh, it's really depressing because what I came to realize is even down to the, the mathematics we use for structural modeling and structural modeling is a mathematical technique that is put in place to be able to be adapted into whatever systems modeling language you want to use. And at the heart of it, though, there's a presumption that there's a belief in such things as facts. <laughs> there's, a, there's a presumption that, uh, there's, uh, that people are behaving as rational actors. And, and there's formal assumptions, for example, as articulated uh, um, you know, in the debates between Gadamer and, uh, and uh, the critical theorists there. Anyway, you know, Habermas. The, the, yeah. Yeah, Habermas, so, that there's a presumption that when you're in a deliberation about a problematic situation, you're bringing together different perspectives because there's a lack of information in any single, per single per person's perspective. And right. that goes back to the 70s when the big, the big buzzword was the need for interdisciplinarity. And that was kind of you know, tied up with the idea of systems that a solution to the interdisciplinarity problem and a solution to the, the problem of, 
uh, putting pluralist ideas together uh, what was, you know, we needed language that accommodated multiple disciplines or we needed processes that allowed multiple perspectives to feed into each other. Yeah. And the problem that we have now is that 30 to 40% of the population does, uh, that they don't care, that's, that's totally not part of their, their view of how the world works. Right. The they problem, live in the, the world of funny. QAnon. I don't know if you've seen a systems, a systems model of the QAnon conspiracy. It's unbelievable. They yeah. sell posters and t-shirts on it. The diagram is so big, you can't, you can't fit it on the wall. And every time there's an objection to something that is clearly wrong, like there was a, uh, you know, a child sex ring in the basement of a pizza place in Washington that didn't even have a basement, right? What they do is they sprout off a whole nother sub conspiracy theory. And our, our methods are not equipped for this. Yeah, the problem is not information. Then. And, and that's, I mean, it was the, the luxury of my starting where I did in terms of, you know, in family therapy, I did not start with any assumptions about rationality because I, I got to know really quickly that rationality was not what drove an awful lot of human behavior, right? I also understood really quickly that giving people information was very rarely the answer. Sometimes information helped, but it was not the root. So yeah, the, the data, research now is that the more information you get, the more polarized yes. you become. Yeah, so here, here's the shift to design. When Bailey would talk about designing, <clears throat> He talked in terms of leaping out. And part of the rationale was, and, and the way he would describe it, if you begin with the system that exists and you try to move from there to a more ideal system, you almost always find yourself stuck in the limitations of the system that you began to work from. And so what he talked about was, and again, he, he referred to this sometimes as the, the leaping out to begin to envision an idealized system of the future that actually meets something new, that creates aspirations, that begins to get at the things that people really care about in the future or for a better situation that aren't confined. Now, you can say, yeah, that gets to be pretty idealistic and unrealistic and is hard to work with. But what I, what I found also in experience was there's an awful lot to that, to not being confined and constrained because it also gets you past the rational and the informational. When people begin to dream about the what could be's that are the things that will pull them towards what they really care about, then you begin to have a, you know, a, a draw, a pull, a something that people can work towards, even if we never completely get there, that's okay. But it's very likely to be better than we could redesign an existing system. And again, it gets past the diagnostic, the informational, the assumptions that we tend to get stuck with. And so to, that's where, for me, bringing that kind of design, the, the dreamy, the innovation, the, the, the desire of what could be the emotional draw can be really powerful. Let me, uh, I have a queue of questions coming yes. up. So we'll, we'll have Elena, and then we will have Tim and Lucia, and then Peter, Elena. I just put a comment in that what we can learn from the, the pandemic and how we can change is the actual opening question of the East integration we're doing this week. And what have you figured out so far, Alana? Pardon? What have you figured out so far? Well, not much, but uh, dissolving disputes, uh, information and good information, um, governance, I'm one of the facilitators and I'm having to bite my tongue because I want to say something. And of course, in a disintegration, the facilitator can't be making her own comments. 
I, I've heard people talk about the opportunities that the pandemic has offered that might be a clue as to how we can make bigger changes, things even like climate change. And on some basis, I really, I agree with that. I really believe that. Unfortunately, the biggest lesson I could say that we've taken from the pandemic so far is that humans really aren't very good at change. And so, you know, if, if you think that it's been hard to adapt to what we've had for the last year, we don't have a clue as to what it's going to be like to really adapt to what we need to 10 years from now. But we have to get serious about where we're headed. So. Oh, I, I certainly agree with that. But obviously, one of the things that we've learned is how poorly the current system works when any kind of disturbance hits it. Yep. Yep. David, there's another question. I'm going I, I to try to keep moving through so we don't lose okay. people. Thank Let's you. Do, Tim? Uh, I was just posting an article that I, I kind of bookmarked in, it was referenced in other readings that I was doing today. And uh, it seemed to me that it could be something that might address Kevin Dye's question about uh, above about uh, anyone articulating the roots of the current situation. Because uh, when I saw this link, it was being characterized as these people predicted this kind of thing. Um, and just for background, those folks, as I understand it, are proponents of uh, um, multi-level evolution, you know, uh, group selection, these kinds of things. You know, that's quite controversial over many, many, many years, uh, but they're trying to apply multi-level uh, selection to social and cultural matters. So the idea, one of their thesis is, you know, the whole question of can, where does cooperation come from? How does cooperation, why do we cooperate at all? And in groups and out groups and this kind of thing, right? So, uh, and just one of the theses is that I'm not sure if it's in that paper because I haven't read it, but it was close proximal to where that link was that I found interesting. And I think it might've been attributed to those authors that I found really interesting. And I kind of, I just liked from a aesthetics, theoretical aesthetic standpoint was that the diversity of rule systems is an indicator of health. In, in a sociocultural sense, in a governance sense, and that uh, as opposed to a monoculture. So it seems to, you know, make some sense, but maybe there's a clue in that as well. I don't know, but anyway, that, that's all. It was just a, an article that I haven't even read. We talk about dangers. Here's an article I haven't read it. Check it out. <laughs> We're worth, worth pursuing. Okay, um, Lucia? Going back to the uh, beginning of your um, of our discussion, uh, Gary, we mentioned that um, the uh, pandemic has a different level of disruption. So within the school system, we also mentioned that uh, the school system is producing an army of, of uh, people that work in, uh, in factories. How far is this uh, thought sort of developed? Because this going to have an immense uh, Lucia, uh, do you have some feedback on your mic? Uh, no, I shouldn't. Hmm. Fine you can by me. Explain? It's fine mm -hmm. by me. Just continue. Okay, so my question is just uh, very quick. Like, how, how deep destruction do you see in terms of, uh, of working systems in, um, in a post, let's say, post-pandemic uh, time? Like, uh, are there any, any clues out there how, how this is going to be resolved if, if the, if the uh, school system is such as already disrupted and uh, the army is not being produced as, as we speak? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I wouldn't try to predict what's going to happen. I think it's well worth considering the some of the issues and the importance of things. So some, some companies have given clues like, you know, we, we really don't see bringing everybody back to regular offices. We're going to be able to let people continue work, working remotely, um, you know, from, for a lot of our jobs. That's fine. People have gotten somewhat used to that, but I can tell you not everybody is going to be a big fan of that. And it brings some additional challenges. So, you know, is that really a good idea? It's fine as, you know, it, it's been an interim strategy. It's very different as a long-term functional strategy. How do you make that work much better? There are questions about the interface with education. I mean, you know, parents have gotten more intimately involved in their kid's school, like it or not. So some of that probably won't completely un become undone. 
but there's a lot of levels about what we return to because they fit the infrastructure and it's just what we know to do, whether that's school or work or some combination. Um, the flexibility of kids working you know, more remotely. I mean, there are kids who certainly used very little uh, actual online technology in a classroom. They've been exposed to that. Some of that probably won't completely come undone. But there are much, much bigger questions about the functionality of school work and our societies. So one of the things that's become real apparent is work life doesn't support family life. They conflict. I mean, it's just, you know, you cannot be both a parent and a worker simultaneously. Now, that's a since the industrial age problem, I think, right? I mean, families and communities and, you know, in, I would guess, agrarian societies really didn't have that kind of conflict because things weren't so separate and so fragmented. But we have these tensions all the time and women bear the brunt of it. Right? I mean, if you're going to bear children and be a mother, you get sidelined in the workplace, or you have to really minimize what you can do as a parent. Men don't get stuck quite as much in the, the confines of that, but it really depends on how they want to function as a parent. But workplaces do not support family life as if somehow the family part of our societies are secondary. That's a problem. Are we gonna actually deal with that? Most companies won't. Are we gonna to begin to at least think about it in terms of social policies? We probably need to, and we don't need to let that just go away. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a question from Dr. Jones who's going in on the deep end, I can see. Uh, okay. Oh, well, let, let me uh, phrase this simply, uh, Gary. So I, I want to hear your thoughts on your approach as a Banathian to social <laughs> system design when the socio-political culture really around us, even Western culture, even the enlightenment is in various stages of collapse. And so people can't agree on what to do and, and the future is uncertain. So there are different philosophies for social system design. That is, is it worth investing in a massive change uh, you know, kind of a, either a social movement or developing, um, you know, movement now, like for a change, a hopeful change process, just because it moves people in the right direction, you know, and then people will identify interventions as they emerge. Or should we design really a wholly alternative future that is more idealized? It brings hope, but it's distant. It is past the point of collapse. I mean, so there's there's an argument to be made to like from a panarchy sense, to really wait until we can see that things are really going to reorganize. And so I just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on given the question of where we, where we might actually be in, in, you know, in this year or two situation. You know, what are your thoughts on, on organizing for, for change in the social system? Well, so let's, let's just start with the foundation. Change is gonna happen. Right, it does. And if you wait until systems break or you wait until environments change dramatically, then we are adapting like any other organism. I mean, I mean we, we will do things differently because we can't do them the same. That's just kind of biological adaptation. Can we predict or do a better job of forecasting something before we have to deal with collapse I think there's that possibility. Do we have the collective will to do it is maybe a different question. People are designing things that are happening for the future. And I mean, my sense of them right now is about 95% of them are all vested in technologies, right? Meaning computer type of technologies. That's where the money is. That's where the interest is. So, you know, yes, we are fixing it. We're fixing transportation by working towards self-driving cars. We're fixing transportation systems by trying to go to electrified cars. Yeah, you're proving okay. my now, point. 
Yeah. So, so but the you know, the, does that fix transportation the way we need for human societies to function better in urban and rural settings where we probably need to undo an awful lot of the infrastructure we have? You know, the, the problem with doing the smaller, short-sighted incremental stuff is that you you've used up so many of your resources doing that that you really lose them to do the bigger stuff, or at least in the short term. So, you know, instead of just electrifying all the current numbers of cars that we have to go into cities, to rethink transportation systems in a way that we get rid of half the cars, don't need them for either because people are working more at home or because there's more public transit or because we just simply have a better way of deciding where people need to be and how, can, how they can access the things they need, we could save a lot of wasted incremental resources along the way. But again, it takes a huge political will. It takes a huge public social will to make those bigger decisions. Yeah, and I agree that's that opens up a huge other next stage problem is of, of then organizing um, the, the comedy, the, um, the collaboration. Um, yes. the, that would need to be across partisans, across across different domains, yeah. across investments. The kind of you know that's we don't have. That's part of what I meant. At the different stages of collapse is that we're seeing a withdrawal of collaboration and and people and systems going their own way. Yeah. Right now, and so. Well, I mean, it's it's I guess for me, Peter, it's a, it's a better or worse sometimes. The the biggest changes seem to come from the biggest breaks. In systems, it's like if a if a system totally collapses, we are willing to really stretch and do something new and different. If we can incrementally do something that fixes it, that tends to be where we go. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one question from Medina, and then we'll switch back to uh, the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I guess my question is a very simple but very complex. Uh, question, and I know that there's probably no answer to it, but when you're looking at things like climate change, it's a very broad, like it's a very big issue and yeah. it's very complex and there's so many interconnected parts to something like climate change. And in many ways, it's considered a wicked problem. Um, you know, in many ways, I think a lot about what's happening in the States and I'm like, you know, is Trumpism a wicked problem? It's connected to so many different things, connect, connected to political systems and uh, different organizations and people. And, you know, I feel like maps can go on and on and on for a really long time. Um, how do you know when to stop? So is it like a sixth sense that you kind of develop as a system thinker? It's, um, do you focus on people who have positional power, or organizations that have positional power? Um, kind of like, when do you know when to stop mapping out a system and then know how to go from there and kind of come up with a solution from there or map out an ideal um, system? <clears throat> well, you're right. It, it is a very complex question. So some of that, I think, is um, some of that has to do with the, the magnitude of what it is that you believe you need to affect. And this is a collective you, right? It's what, what can the people who are involved actually deal with in a way that they feel like they can create some kind of a change, a new system, a whatever. But it, it, it's always gonna be a combination of the people who are involved relative to their capabilities and resources relative to the magnitude of the change. You, you, I mean, you, you really cannot go beyond the capacities of the people who are involved in the change to create something that is so different, it's far beyond their scope to even envision, right? Now, you, you might say, for instance, turn over the, a change that needs to be made to an expert group that is so versed in whatever's going on that they really can both envision and begin to design and maybe enact something that is far beyond what the general populace could envision. But you know, you've still got to somehow come back and connect 
people's ability to live out that change. So let's just go back to the transportation system. You could do what would be a hundred year change for transportation systems in you know, an envisioned new city. But if it was so unfamiliar that people had no idea what to do with it, they simply wouldn't. And they'd simply try to start gravitating back. I mean, you, you'll find them some, you know, kind of shoehorning whatever they normally do into something that's familiar enough that can, they can behave and then get their hands around it and know how to act. So it, it is always a combination, I think, of the people involved and the possibilities and the capacities they have to act and change. I don't mean to, that to be a waffling answer, but that's, um, <laughs> that, that's a practical answer for me. Oh, for sure. And I really appreciate that. It's something that's always like been on my mind, um, especially more recently than ever, because um, I feel like you can often find yourself getting lost in thinking of all of the ways in which a particular problem or a system is affected by so many other things. It's so interlocking. Um, so I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I dropped a link in um, in the chat uh, on the Handbook of System Sciences, and uh, Gary's been an editor of that. Um, but in particular, um, he's going to talk a little bit about the chapter that's actually not published there yet, um, and uh, and the work he's been doing with Stuart Kaufman from the Santa Fe Institute. Okay. So um, this, this takes us really back to kind of the origin of some of the big questions. And, and I'm, I'm glad, by the way, the, the Handbook of System Sciences is being published as a reference book by Springer. That means that if you've got access to a really big library, when it gets published, you, you'll have the whole thing. There's 50, 49 chapters, I think, in total. Um, <clears throat> and actually, Peter helped um, edit a section of it. So you have four chapters in it, I think, Peter, you and your collaborators. Um, Anyway, it, the introductory chapter that I that twisted Stuart Kaufman's army to co-authoring co with me tries to go back and look at the origin of some of the really big questions, all the way back to you know, ancient Greeks and not just their theories of what they were proposing. I mean, that, that is of interest is how, how much of, a, of an influence they had on the development of Western science for the last 2,500 years. I'm less interested in those connections as fascinating as they are about you know, the things they proposed way, way beyond what they could have ever envisioned in terms of technology and instruments and all the, the things they founded. You know, the, the, the proposal that there might be atoms back in ancient Greece before they could even think about how to investigate it's the nature of their questions that are the most enduring because we continue to ask the same kind of questions in new ways at different levels in you know, using different technology. <clears throat> Part of the learning for me is to look at the nature of those questions and then think about what we think we know now and project 500, or a thousand or 2,500 years from now. And don't assume that we have all the answers as complete as we think they are now. You know, we continue to make incremental changes and learn and make sometimes huge leaps only to find that we're asking new, bigger, different questions. So the for people who are familiar with these, these different fields, these different realms, I guess, of system science that's often posed as separate from cybernetics, that is, for a lot of people, definitely separate from complexity science. Not only were a lot of the same questions involved, there were a whole lot of people that overlapped with each other that were involved in doing all kinds of research that fed into one arena or another, and they somehow got lumped in there. But it didn't mean that the ideas didn't cross over, and it didn't mean that they weren't talking to each other in all kinds of venues all the time. And so for me, it really was just one kind of continuation, even though the, 
sometimes the theories look different. The, the ideas got presented in different venues that weren't necessarily understood or affiliated with each other. They really are just one continuation of a lot of questions getting asked by different people and answered in various kinds of ways um, that created more of one long stream than they did whole separate camps or pools. So as a formality, the, the cybernetics group coming out of the Macy conferences really formalized first. So let's back up to where some of this came from. <clears throat> Early 20th century, 19, 1905 was, um, was Einstein's first theory of special relativity. 10 years later, he came out with general relativity. Okay, so you've got the, these very early huge advancements in science per se, really in physics. Led us into World War I, which led us to the Great Depression, which led us into World War II. World War II broke a lot of things. So you can, in, in terms of all these different people and their questions and the science and the movements, World War II is probably as good a marker as any of the rest of them, both in and coming out of World War II. World War II was the first really industrial war. You know, you had World War I was still a lot of horses and some small tanks and a whole lot of people in trenches. World War II was major ships and air forces and all kinds of technical equipment that not only had to be supported and managed, it was also huge numbers of people that were managed. So in World War II, you, think, you find things like operations research to figure out how to move huge numbers of people and also all the supplies they needed. You have the advent of things like systems engineering. You have a lot of the things that we think of as being, you know, later applications that came out, came really into practice during that time. Coming out of World War II, you have a lot of the vestiges of the people who were impacted by that beginning now to think, so what do we do? How do we take these things and go further with them? Um, I, I was interested actually, and I, I looked up the other day just out of, out of curiosity, <clears throat> kind of what Stafford's um, history was, you know, kind of his, his trajectory during World War II. He was born the same year as my father, and they both went into the war about the same time. Stafford went in at 18, my father went in at, at 17 years old. You know, my father was only in three years. He was on two different aircraft carriers for the U.S. military, for the U.S. Navy. You know, Stafford was in and, and I guess went to India and, and had a very different kind of experience, but it very much colored his psychology of working with soldiers in the British military, very much colored what he saw as being really important issues that began with the foundations for Bible systems and the other work that he did. You know, the people that worked in, uh, well, Jay Forrester was working in anti-aircraft systems. That was the foundation for system dynamics. You know, there were, there were multiple examples of the whole Tavistock group, right? The Tavistock group actually was around during World War I, and they were a big consultant about military issues in World War II. And so a lot of the work they did as basically psychiatrists in the military founded what came later as they were developing socio-technical systems. Those broken systems created the foundation for all kinds of innovation and all kinds of things that really led to bigger questions. So out of World War II, you had the Ford Foundation creating funding that actually supported the work that turned into the Society for General Systems Research, which became the IEEE. The Macy conferences came out of a need to understand information and communication. That's what they were focused on. That's what became cybernetics. There were people, um, one of the interesting things when I was doing research about the article, um, Warren Weaver was talking in the early 1940s about complexity. 
And complexity didn't become a formal separate area of discipline until much later. But he had founded the same ideas early on. So people were asking questions about how do we think about our societies? How do we decide about science? What's important to know? What do we fund in terms of research? The, the commonality, so you've got people like John von Neumann, who was huge in you know, creating the foundations for computers and computer science. He was very involved in the ideas that fed into cybernetics. He was heavily influential in the kind of ideas that people picked up, not so formally in terms of system science, because it was more, it was a bit of an offshoot. So by the time system science was, was forming, it was really people asking about the nature of living systems as compared to physics. Our physical systems, do they somehow just, you know, whatever is in them, you know, the, the space dust that landed on the earth, did that somehow just organize itself into life and that's what happened? Is that the answer? Is that somehow we can look at the properties of particles and we can explain life? And needless to say, that's been a long argument and discussion in all kinds of ways, but it was theoretical physicists who were trying to bridge that distinction between physics and, and biology, who really founded the origins for what became the system sciences. They didn't leave behind everything else. They were just asking bigger and different kinds of questions. If you jump to the Santa Fe Institute, when it was founded, it was founded you know, using, bringing in a whole bunch of MacArthur Fellows and Nobel laureates who wanted to ask bigger questions because they were, you know, huge scientists, huge well-known people in their sciences, but they were confined there. And what they also quickly learned, even as Nobel laureates and MacArthur Fellows was, when you got outside of your traditional disciplinary boundaries, you really stepped in territory where people didn't understand what to do. And so they didn't fund it, they didn't understand it. And there was an awful lot of push. There was a huge amount of pressure that goes back at least, at least to just post-World War II that says, we wanna make science just something that is confined, it's disciplinary, it fits the structure that happens in universities, that fits the structure that happens in funding sources, it fits the structure of what happens in, in academic journals and therefore, you know, that's the way science works. And it's created a lot of those um, problems that we've talked about, about why systems science per se is so hard or, or cybernetics or complexity, any of the above are really hard to find in traditional university programs because they break the walls, they break those boundaries. They, they don't fit, you know, which, which department do you stick it in? because it's gonna get funded, because it feeds into research, because it goes to certain journals. You know, it, it, those, those barriers have really created an awful lot of the problems for asking the questions that get to some of the things we're talking about tonight. How do you begin to address really big problems when they aren't just simple disciplinary problems? So the, the interesting contrast, what I raised in, in writing the, uh, this particular chapter with Stu was <clears throat> looking at really two people to try to begin to make sense of this. So one was Stu and his own background and the other is as contrasted with Robert Rosen. Now they actually knew each other and they both were in their own way th theoretical physicists. Stu also though was a medical doctor and he, he transversed those different disciplines. So he has talked about all kinds of really theoretical things and bringing in spirituality and, you know, approaching all kinds of things that are way, way beyond biology, medicine, or even physics in traditional senses. But he still works in those camps and his work is cited in really traditional work in journals. And he also knew that every time he came up with something which sounded really far afield, you know, he could propose certain things, but he also had to go back to, so what's testable, 
what is legitimate in terms of science in order not to get lost and not to lose credibility for it. The challenge that Robert Rosen faced as a theoretical biologist was that he really felt that the purity of the models in mathematics were the most important things and that there therefore would not be a need to go back to you know, a regular wet biology lab to have to prove those things. That wasn't where the ideas got tested the most. And he ran into a tremendous amount of pushback because it was hard to get accepted in biology as a whole when you only worked in pure mathematical theories. And so this, this combination, this dance between the theories and the application, the, the willingness to have the credibility in traditional science while also really exploring the bigger ideas that we have to have beyond those disciplines, that tension, that ability to go back and forth between, I think is really critical for how we move forward and how we begin to advance the things that we're gonna to have to face. So enough of that. Other questions, David, that came up or, or Dan or anybody else, um, you know, just from listening to this part. You're muted, David. David. The perils of having two no, monitors. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I was saying, I was saying that uh, you made a right turn there, and so uh, it's going to take a while for the questions to catch up, I think. <laughs> um, so so I, I found it very interesting, uh, since I, you, you had the benefit of uh, sending me the chapter in advance, um, uh, reading the article um, in the sense that uh, Stuart Kaufman was a co-author. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that he's a scientist, but then the question is, how does he write a scientific article in which he's involved? And, and I found that a really interesting uh, background sort of thing because it's like, okay, the, I, I, we, ha we have to have this problem with Wikipedia. Uh, people have ever edited on Wikipedia. You're not allowed to edit your own Wikipedia pages. Yeah. So, so, so I'll be upfront that, you know, I edit Gary Metcalf's Wikipedia page because I know him well enough that I think he probably thinks I'm okay. <laughs> Besides, if you didn't, nobody would. So thank you. Right. <laughs> but uh, but but in writing that chapter with uh, with Stuart, um, how how was he feeling about writing it and and putting it together and relating those stories in his perspective? Well, there there are probably multiple parts to the question, David. One of those is how you write together. You know, <clears throat> so in this case, um, Stu and I have been talking. We talk mostly once a week and have been for at least four years. You know, there are periods of breaks and whatever, but we, we talk frequently, you know, and sometimes it's about theoretical stuff and sometimes it's other stuff. So we spend a lot of time simply talking about the ideas, but mostly I did the writing and then I would send him drafts and, you know, he would look at them and say, oh yeah, that makes sense or no, that's kind of off base and, you know, let's go to that. It was also um, probably easier in this case because, you know, I've got a whole line of Stu's books here that, you know, I, I can use those as points of reference. Um, but it was really a matter of trying, you know, somehow to capture um, this, this history and the concepts together. And so, you know, there are a couple of pretty good books about complexity, um, particularly about the Santa Fe Institute or about the ideas more generally. There are the books that Stu had written already, and you know a lot of the early, the early origin stuff um, came from a guy that, that actually was a Saybrook grad some years before I was, Richard Tarnas, um, who did a lot of the the history of Western thinking and you know coming out of the Greeks, and so that was just foundational material for both of us that you know we were actually reading and working on together. Um, you know his to say that he had any particular objectivity about those things, it was really more, you know, I wanted the credibility of him working with me to make sure I had the, the idea straight. 
And so that was probably more of the process. Thanks. Um, Dean had a question outstanding from the uh, previous round. Okay. If he's shifted, Dean? Thanks, David. Uh, Gary, uh, sort of a two-part question for you. It might have it might have flowed nicely from the last question you had uh, from uh, Medina, but I'll ask it now anyway. Uh, so, given your um, you know being immersed in the world of how systems thinkers and modelers are trying to understand really hard problems, and I'm specifically interested in climate change, something I've worked on a lot in my career. Um, so to, you know, I guess the first part is, are you a believer in design for solving really hard problems like climate change versus do you think that we have no option but to stumble our way forward blindly and deal with events as they happen and hit us in the face? Um, and, you know, the, the, the second part of that being, if you do think we can design to solve problems like climate change, and I don't know if that's an area that you have looked a lot at the climate change issue, but when I think about things that you know um, are being floated as policy solutions, things like economic incentives and carbon pricing, things like you know in Canada we have a clean fuel standard that's coming, and various sorts of regulatory approaches that can be brought in to shift uh, people's behavior on reducing GHGs. Do you think that those kinds of solutions that are being floated? align well with how a systems thinker would would approach the problem or do you think that they are missing the boat curious your views on that well <clears throat> so let me say that for the past been a little over a year probably 14 months i've gotten a lot more seriously involved in climate change issues so i was at a meeting in in stockholm a year ago in december um about climate change that really kind of kicked off some stuff. I mean, this was this was a smaller meeting of people that were actually, you know, Stu Kaufman and a number of other people were there wanting to bring a, a complexity perspective to climate change. Okay. And that those discussions continued on since then in various ways. And so that that work is kind of continuing to try to bring a different and a larger perspective to climate change issues. Can we design, um, I, for me, the, the question that follows that is how much, you know, can we redesign the biosphere? I don't think so. Is, do, it's critical that we understand some of the truly foundational function of the biosphere to know how to design one of the questions is the degree to which we try to identify what to focus on for a different kind of efforts. So let's, let's say that, for instance, there's, there's a huge part of this that has to do with energy sources, right? So one, one problem is we've got to quit using fossil fuels. Well, you still have to have energy. You've got choices embedded in that. One is we use a lot less energy. And therefore the sources we need are different. Another is we begin to envision sources that are so abundant that you know, we really don't have to go to some kind of a, a limited way. We don't have to constrain ourselves to you know, kind of a, a bare subsistence. Um, <clears throat> you know, their calculations are, they're really, um, Buckluff Smeal is a guy there in Canada that's done some really good work on energy, right? Um, he, he's a great source for talking about kind of the, the levels of energy per capita in different societies that, you know, can give you everything from basic subsistence to, you know, much bigger um, possibilities so that you aren't just entirely constrained. What's it gonna take to do that? You know, there are, there are companies that are coming up with, you know, better things than not just good solar panels, but these huge production facilities. Heliogen is a company that's doing stuff so that you actually have solar power that can produce enough energy that you can do things like, you know, steel or concrete or things that are way beyond what you could do with regular solar panels. 
are those the right kind of approach? You know, electrification of all the things that we use, all the end products, is one of the goals and challenges depending upon, again, you know, what you see as being what's necessary. Um, electrification of all of our human products is not going to solve things like, um, you know, the it was national, well, in fact, I saw, I think, three different sources today. There, there's an article in Nature that's reporting like 12 different studies talking about the loss of insects. The loss of species is a huge problem. The electrification of what we use like cars is not going to solve the climate impact that you know, is going to happen in certain places anyway. And I'm just as concerned about things like, you know, um, unintended or unplanned migration of people from places that get impacted by severe weather results that we don't have any good plans for. So, you know, there are so many possible outcomes of what we're looking at in terms of creating enough stability in the world that, you know, you you can't just make a change that totally undermines every economy of the world. We've got to have some kind of a transition that keeps people stable enough. That was a huge lesson from the pandemic, right? You can't just make people stop going to work. That doesn't work because one thing, they won't comply. So you've got to have something that creates enough of a bridge there. Can we control enough of the probable impacts to make sure we've got stable housing and food supplies for people in areas that have some probability of being impacted the most in the next decade? Maybe a different kind of question. Can we begin to deal with species impact? It's really critical if we're going to maintain a biosphere that's anything like what we're living in right now. There are people that are talking about soil mitigation. That's a huge deal. It can help with the, you know, the carbon problem, carbon sequestration, although soil is also an emitter of carbon. That's another big issue. But to go back to, you know, can, can you scale up more sustainable farming practices that help on multiple levels and help also with stability of, of social systems and employment? Probably. It's a big change. Can we get people to that level of change to help them adapt that fast? It's really going to take, I think, a concerted effort of enough people, both scientists and politicians and political scientists and activists of all kinds and economists to begin to prioritize where we're going to put our resources and efforts in the most essential changes over the next decade and two decades to decide what's feasible that's enough so that we don't simply spend a whole lot of money and effort on things that get us halfway there and aren't good enough three decades from now. Long answer, is that? That's great, thanks very much. So we have a queue of questions. We have Zad, uh, Dan, and then Kevin. Um, in the spirit of time and questions, Dan, I like yours more than mine. So I'll pass my mine to you, Dan. But if you want to integrate what I'm hinting at, they're kind of somewhat related. So Dan, you can go ahead. And if you want to integrate my question into yours, you can. Zad, you're such a gentleman. <laughs> you kind of like that. <laughs> Okay, so let me, uh, I guess, uh, Gary, we, we've talked about, um, you know, that some of the questions that uh, I'm going to raise here, because I read your article beforehand, of course. And the key thing I wanted to, you know, just to share with the audience here is that, you know, you've raised this um, through the history, the description of the history, there's a real break between what research has been done in the past in system sciences, cybernetics and complexity. And in fact, it seems like they don't talk to each other. Um, the other, what Zad was talking about was really, I think along the same lines is that, you know, we've been at this system science stuff for about, I don't know, century, I guess he's saying, how are we doing here? You know, like it's, you know, for guys like me, I'm kind of thinking we 
got to have something we accomplished or, or whatever. So given that this is the state of the world, what are the implications, Jerry, you know, Gary, what are the, what does this mean for us? Is it the end of our, our world? Like what's going to happen here? Tell, tell me that's a light at the end of the tunnel on this thing. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot embedded there needs to say, Dan. Um, things, if you look at the history of science, we really aren't doing as badly as it might seem, right? I mean, all, all this stuff about like quantum theory, this was 1920 stuff, right? I mean, we're, it's been a hundred years and it's not like we got our, that all figured out. You know, it, it seems like it's a whole lot better. So to say that we've been at, you know, system science for, you know, in a rigorous way for 60 years, um, no, we don't have all the answers yet, but it really is time to get on with it and let's start getting serious about it. You know, I mean, it's really time that we get past trying to promote old theories and particularly old gurus and have some of you younger people get involved and say, okay, fine, which of these things work where and why? I mean, that, that was my very earliest questions coming into, you know, we took me into system science, but it really was, you know, a bigger question anyway. In family therapy, uh, that's a really good technique. Why do you think that works? With whom? You know, why am I going to try that with a particular family in a particular setting? Because I don't want to be just making guesses all the time. You know, I don't want to be flying by the seat of my pants because these people are really in trouble. So why do you think that one works? Same questions in management, consulting. Why do you think that works? I, I'm not just interested in doing your dog and pony show one more time. I want to know why it's going to work in that setting with this particular problem. Those are the kind of questions where you start testing theories and hypotheses and coming up with a little better agreement about what makes sense, what's likely to work and where we need to really put our time and energy. How much hope do we have? Humans have existed a long time. Doesn't mean we always will. You know, cockroaches and crocodiles are better off. Um, when it's all said and done, maybe it's the bacteria. You know, they, they started, I mean, if you want to go back to a species that started the first catastrophic change in the environment, it took bacteria about a billion years to go from a, you know, a pretty oxygen poor environment to a very oxygen rich environment. But they totally destroyed the environment relative to what it had been it just became a new environment that we're kind of glad for now. We still, bacteria still inhabit us. You know, if you look at the information about gut biomes or, you know, the, the microbiomes that um, we actually still have living on our skin, we live in a very microbiome kind of world. That's exactly what soil is about we need to take care of those things as well as really pay attention to the larger aspects. And so there's an awful lot of confluence that we have to pay attention to, I think. That's really gonna be maybe the next big challenge. How do we understand the most essential systems of this biosphere and realign the changes we make with those that will continue to, well, in, in a lot of cases, recreate a healthier, environment for all of us. Hey, thank you, Gary. Are you okay with that, Zad? Or did you have something you want to add to that? Um, I have, I'll come back. No, do it. Okay, do it. Well, it's, it's, it's um, uh, Gary, you mentioned uh, folks like Stuart Kaufman even bring in some of the, some of the spiritual elements. And in your discussion, uh, I hope this is not posing a question too far for you, but you kind of gone up to that boundary of not going into the spiritual world. And I wonder when we're talking about boundaries and essential systems, what role does that play for you personally when you are analyzing or looking at the world of system sciences? Well, it's actually come up in, in recent discussions. Um, <clears throat> it actually came out of the, uh, several weeks ago, we had another online meeting um, that was about the, some of the climate change issues. And so spirituality has been a part of that. The way it came up was looking back at the axial age. Now, if you're 
not familiar with that. That was basically the you know 500 um, BC up to 800 BC up to about 300 BC. Essentially, it was the establishment of the world, um, the, the great religions of the world. The point is, it was an enormous shift in how people saw the world. Right? It wasn't all the same. I mean, it was the, the age of Confucius. It was the age of Buddha. It was the age of Judaism. It was the age of ancient Greece and their philosophies. But it was an enormous shift in mindsets, in belief systems of humans that helped them see the world differently. One of the questions that has come up is, what's it going to take in terms of a shift in mindset for humans to be able to envision a world differently that we can now have the ideas and the capacities to redesign where we've got to be. Spirituality is a huge part of that. You know, part of it is the confines of what we currently believe from the existing religions or faiths or, you know, the idea that, you know, humans had not only a right but a responsibility to dominate and use the earth. That one's probably got to go. Um, what do we envision beyond this? You know, do we go back to some indigenous beliefs and reinvestigate those? Do we somehow come up with a, a new way to envision our relationship with each other and the earth and deal with, you know, our own mortality, which is at the root of an awful lot of it? Um, you know, I, it, it's there. You know, it's not a simple answer, but it's absolutely a part of what we've got to think through and, and begin to question. Okay. okay. So I have a lot of back channel between um, uh, between Kevin and Peter, both okay. of who have access to you directly. Uh, so I'll, I'll throw it over to Kevin and Peter and they can wrestle, but they can only wrestle for about 10 minutes and we'll wrap that after that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think it might be best to continue Dan's point. Uh, I mean, mine is just subtle variation of it. Um, Peter Tuttenham, who was a former president of the IFSS, uh, was involved with uh, Gary several years ago in uh, an IFSR conversation on the promotion of systems literacy. And uh, he's been in, engaged in that after he did an ocean literacy project and an earth systems literacy and and so forth. And um, he was hoping that, you know, something like structured dialogue might help, uh, you know, promote the systems literacy. And I thought he meant take the body of literature, the oeuvre or whatever, and get it out in the world and help it in an educational sense. And he actually meant just getting the different camps of the system scientists to talk to each other and like in some <laughs> grand unification scheme. And like, when we talk about you know, literacy in English literature, we don't have a grand unified theory of what English literature is. We read Shakespeare, we read Jane Austen, you know, we, read, we read different books. But when it comes to systems literacy, there's like this big, very strong camp that wants to see some grand unification. And uh, it seems to me and other people like uh, Gerald Midgley, that is kind of, one of the things that's gone off the rails with the systems science movement. So I'm just uh, curious in your opinion, you were overseeing the IFSR during that conversation. Yeah, so my, first of all, my read about literacy, my interpretation of that, Kevin, is really not literacy, maybe in the way other people interpret that. It's, it's fundamental competencies. It's really having enough of an essential grasp about the, the basic properties, the basic um, approaches to, so if, if you can begin to envision seeing and dealing with systems in a way that aren't just absolute and, and fixed and concrete, but you have the ability to ask questions and reframe that's the beginning for me of that kind of competency so that we can begin to ask the bigger questions together. It's not a unification for me about pre-existing theories. I think it's probably helpful to put a lot of those on the table, but you gotta know that a whole lot of them are not gonna survive because they aren't the best. 
we, we really need got we, one part of this is we really need to bring that approach to science to some of the existing theories. We got to quit protecting them as if they are sacrosanct, and we got to try them by fire and just say some of them are going to work better than others, some of them better in some situations. Let's now just let some of them go and get together about beginning to use the principles and the approaches that are the most fundamental. And a lot of times they aren't that different. You know, the, the, fun, the foundations aren't that different, but that's what we got to get to is what's important about this work so that it's useful enough to apply to real problems. Is a part of that an understanding of people working together? Absolutely. You know, the work that you've been involved with for, you know, since you and I met with through Aleko years and years ago, it's really important. It's been, it's changed and refined over the years, right? You know, yeah. it, it's, it happens in different ways. The fundamental goal of bringing people together and helping them understand each other in ways they wouldn't normally do that's, it's still critical. How we go about it, I'm not so ready to the tools. But, the, the, but our mentors, you know, the, the mentors of our generation were driven apart for a number of reasons. You know, Hassan Ozbekan's uh, paper, The Predicament of Mankind in 1970, that led to the limits to growth work of the Forrester and Meadows group, um, basically split off six of the methodologies that became the structural modeling people and the Forrester group, because they were just trying to get the money for that project from Volkswagen Corporation where just created systems dynamics. And then because they had to have their own thing, their own name, this whole body of methods that was created as a collective front end to systems dynamics became completely different schools. And the, the apprentices of those people weren't really a, encouraged to talk to each other. The journals encourage them to specialize themselves and therefore name things that they're the same thing with different names, creating confusion in the literature. And almost every branch and methodology of system science has done this for the past 60 years. You know, well, I'm, when I'm, you that's have, my opinion. Yes, and when you have the luxury of not having to um, actually test your theories, it's fine. You can get away with that for a long time. Yeah. You know, when you get shoved into the Manhattan Project, you better know what you're doing because it's kind of put up or shut up. And that's where we got to get. Yeah, I agree. Well, if I just finish, um, Gary, I'd say we're in a place where um, the cultures have changed so much from the period of uh, the Club of Rome and the development of the, of the system, the various systems movements the methodology schools, the different waves of methodology. And so some of us grew up through some of these different, you know, schools. I mean, it seems like each decade there's another, um, there's another uh, approach that becomes um, dominant. Um, you know, we're working with systemic design now, a fusion of, of appropriate systems, methods and models and thinking practices in a deliberate design approach and it takes into account uh, uh, structure dialogic design di um, dialogic design theory and going back to Ozbekan. But we have to create new contexts um, because the contexts of those other periods were created by the corporate, political and problematic states of the time. I mean, just because we are still living in the global problematique and the continuous problems that um, that critical problems that Ozbekan had identified in 1970 are still with us doesn't mean that we have to address them in the same way. Uh, we are, are, the contexts are so different now. And I, I think one of the, the, one of the concerns I have is in the systems literacy or literacies and in other approaches to training is that we're training for um, methods and approaches and literacies from a classical canon, if you will, which is good, which is not disproven, but they were developed and used in, ap in areas and applications that don't exist in the same way now. And that even though they're still valid, they don't speak to 
the context that we have now. They, I think we need to transform the methods. That's not the issue. It's that we have to create new context. Even the universities are not supporting uh, very well uh, systems literacies. I mean, they've become, they became very specialized from the 1950s and research council fundings, the interdisciplinarity is difficult and systems education comes and goes. A context like this, like actual con conversational context, such as you know, larger and larger online gatherings where people are kind of, kind of waking up together and realizing we need to take different approaches and we don't know where, or we need to create context where people can communicate collegially in ways to, to really listen to each other's perspectives. And that's what's been missing for a good number of years is the ability to just listen to, to, to actually create these deliberations again that we used to have so much faith in from dialogic design and, 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 and syndication is similar. I mean, the problem is getting people together in a context where the outcomes of these deliberations, the outcomes of, 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 the, of, of, of systemic design can make a difference. And, and we, you know, otherwise we're just continuing to do analyses, reports, dialogues and pr proposals. You know, it's we're in a place where we have to envision not just the change, but the the ground in which that change occurs, and and, and that that create that's a different type of language. So, that's my summary yeah. of the political will and the problems with deliberation and the systems literacies. I mean, we can't all have all these different projects and expect them to make a difference. We have yeah. to really envision where they're going to make a difference, how we can create these contexts. Yeah. Well, partly we need real problems to solve. We need to get really serious about solving real problems and figuring out what works. I mean, it took me 20 years from my introduction into family therapy to understand that a lot of what I was working on actually came from Bateson and the Palo Alto School that he had created and the different, I knew nothing about where those ideas had come from when I was learning family therapy. It was 20 years later before I finally began to unwind all that stuff, okay? But it didn't really matter at the time, but it did matter to me later about why people believed that we were, should be doing one thing versus another. You know, I, I'm waiting right now to hear about a proposal from one of the major global consulting firms that may have a, a contract coming up um, that I couldn't understand what it was they were asking for. And it, again, I had to dig and dig and dig back into figuring out they're really asking for something that is systemic, but they're calling it design thinking, okay? That is the moniker that's made its way into federal agencies and what they mean are systems principles, but that's not what they're calling them. I don't care, I'm fine with that. I don't really care what the language is they use as a point of entree. I do care about how they're using what they say they think is gonna work and that actually has some kind of rigorous foundation and they aren't just passing it off saying, okay, we're gonna do causal loop diagrams and call it good. Can I ask a last question? Uh, go. Okay, go. And then this is the very last question we're gonna wind up. Okay, it's, it's really short. So Gary, do you think there's any hope for humans or human systems in the next 60 years? Yes. I want an honest answer. Yeah. I mean, we, we have survived all kinds of things, Nishad. You know, we, it, it, and not always easily and not always in the ways that we wanted to, but we are a pretty resilient species. You know, um, we, we have the capacities to handle an awful lot of things. We don't necessarily have the political will to do them quickly and we may suffer if we just delay too long, but, I, I think we have all kinds of capacities to adapt, um, you know, and we've got some history to prove that. Are, are we going to last as long as crocodiles? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Gary. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that uh, we'll, I think we've tired everyone out, but uh, thanks, Gary, for uh, some thinking on Harry. 
Um, I've dropped a link in to uh, LinkedIn. You can find Gary. I noticed he changed his photograph recently, so his LinkedIn has been updated. Well, I, I, it was a little out of date. So. Yeah, <laughs> <Sure>. okay. <laughs> I, I never change my photograph. It's okay. <laughs> Um, so uh, um, next month, uh, still working on agenda. It'll be the second Monday in February, um, and we'll meet again. So have a good night.